everyone can get settled and um, everyone can start. All the audience can settle in and get their books out ready to listen in. Okay. Great. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to PMP Live. My name is Jane, and I'm a bookseller in the Children and Teens Department at Politics and Prose. Thank you for tuning in to our virtual event where we continue to bring authors and new books to you in the comfort of your own home. I'm excited about today's event with author Charles R. Smith Jr. and illustrator Adele Rogers, who will be discussing their picture book, Song for Jimmy, the story of guitar legend Jimi Hendrix. Today's event is presented in partnership with DC Public Library and the DC Public Library Foundation. We have closed captions enabled for this event. If you would like to view the captions, click the live transcript button and select show subtitle. You can adjust the size of the subtitles by clicking subtitle settings. For those of you who registered and opted for the complimentary copy of Song for Jimmy, your book is available for pickup in the children's room at the Martin Luther King branch of DC Public Library. Please note the address and the deadline for pickup in the chat. We'll also drop the book purchase link in the chat for those who weren't part of the compl complimentary copy offer and who would like to order the book, which will be on sale in our store when it releases November 23rd. I'm excited to introduce our author and illustrator, but before I do, let me first introduce our moderator, Tony Jackson, who is a senior at School Without Walls. Besides working on the teen council and as a teen aide at the Georgetown Library, he's an editor with, this, with the school newspaper, plays bass and jazz band, and is a graduate from the Northwestern University's Metal Cherubs Journalism Program. I am honored to introduce today's special guests. Charles R. Smith is an award-winning author, photographer, and poet with more than 30 books to his credit. His awards include a Coretta Scott King Award for his photographs accompanying the Langston Hughes poem, My People, and a Coretta Scott King Honor for his biography on Muhammad Ali, 12 Rounds to Glory. He is also the author of Rim Shots, Hoop Kings, Hoop Queens, Tall Tales, Short Takes, Diamond Life, and I Am America. Adele Rodriguez is a Cuban-American artist who has exhibited internationally with shows in Los Angeles, Toronto, New York, Dallas, Philadelphia, and Spain. Inspired by personal history, religious rituals, politics, memory, and nostalgia, his bold figurative works are an examination of identity, culture, displacement, cultural displacement, and mortality. Rodriguez's artwork is in the collections of a variety of institutions, including the Smithsonian Institute and Washington, D.C. Charles and Adele, over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so first, I'd like to say um, to the folks out there that's checking this out, you are the very first to get a taste of this book, Song for Jimmy. Uh, it is not even out yet. It will officially be out uh, on my mom's 75th birthday. Uh, which is fitting, <laughs> given that it took a while to get here, but it was worth it. And so let's get talking about Jimmy. Um, so of course the book is called Song for Jimmy and it is written in the format of a song. There are five different verses. There is an intro, there is an outro, and there is an interlude. And each of those parts of the song tell a different part of his life. So it opens with the first verse where we talk about the blues. Let me tell you a story about a boy who became a man, a guitar man named Jimmy. Now with his magic left hand, this guitar man could strum silver strings and conjure a rainbow of sound that screeched past the stars, echoed off the moon and earthquake planet Mars. Vroom, yeah! Jimmy was far out, but dig, Jimmy wasn't born with that magic left hand. So let's rewind in time to when his life began. And that begins the story of Jimi Hendrix's life, one filled with a childhood filled with blues, with his mother and father constantly fighting until it's finally his mom just left. And when she left, that broke Jimmy apart so much that he turned inward. And when he turned inward, the way that he began coming out of that was he taught himself to draw pictures. His grandmother had told him stories of his Cherokee ancestry, of warrior lineage, lineage, and it inspired him and it motivated him to teach himself to draw. 
Now, once he learned how to draw, he was able to find a way to express himself. But then he started expressing himself through sound as he listened to uh, the popular radio uh, personalities of the day, popular um, musicians of the day. As his father would ask him to clean the house, he would take a broom and he would strum along with the broom pretending it was his own guitar. Now, that's one of the things that I'll mention first off is the use of my word guitar. Um, as a poet, I use it as a poetic device because it really puts the emphasis on this instrument. We don't just let it go by itself, guitar. We put some emphasis on it, guitar. And so that gives him this is like his uh, sword to conquer the uh, battles that he is fighting. And so once Jimmy taught himself to draw and he got into music and he started listening to music, uh, he graduated from the broom and when his dad found a one string ukulele. Now, after that one string ukulele, he found an acoustic guitar, maybe two strings. <laughs> and he started teaching himself to play on that and just strumming along and just following along uh, to the songs that he would listen to on the radio. His father saw that he had a keen interest in learning the guitar. So by his 16th birthday, he got him one. Now, when you get an, if you've ever played an electric guitar, an electric guitar does not have actual sound itself. You need an amp. You need something for the sound to travel through. So Jimmy had to find a band and he found a band called the Rocking Kings. The Rocking Kings had an amp and that amp allowed him to do his thing. He would practice and practice and practice. He practiced so hard and so long that every day he taught himself a new song. Every single day he taught himself a new song. And he would play in a variety of different bands, learning different things. And from each musician that he saw, he took a little something different. From sax players, he learned to swoop and soar over the rhythm section to move feet on the dance floor. From blues men, he studied their show-stopping tricks like playing behind the back with lightning quick flicks. And so when Jimmy played to small assorted crowds, he imitated his idols by playing hard and loud. Round, 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 yeah. He imitated his idols by playing with lots of flash, causing Jimmy and his own bandmates to clash. Then Jimmy began to steal the spotlight, taking solos and plucking like a wild man every night. With feathers on his guitar, you know, Jimmy was quite a sight. Who is this cat playing with his left hand? Everyone asked when Jimmy took the stand. But at the end of each set, they all knew Jimmy's name. They all knew his left hand could flicker like a flame. So I'm gonna I want Edel to actually talk about this spread uh, because this is actually one of my favorite spreads in the book. I love the the fact that the you know the first words are from sax players. He learned to swoop, swoop and soar, and to me this image has that soaringness to it with the cross diagonal line. So Edel, why don't you tell us about that? Um, well, I, well, what I was trying to uh, to do in, in every uh, spread is somehow um, connect Jimmy's gestures to what was happening around him, to the background in some way. Um, and uh, this idea of soaring, you know, I, I sketched him out with his arm out like that. And then um, I was like, what pattern do I fit in here? Because <laughs> I was trying, if you look at every spread, there's kind of like a minimalist, you know, like a soul weight kind of pattern in behind. Uh, the the images and um, and that's the one that kind of popped into my mind uh, and also that image is kind of it's it's still like in the transition you know the the earlier years are kind of like these light blues then it slowly moves into purples darker blues and it hasn't yet gone you know when, like, because he's still in the I think the fifties um, or sixties um, and so it's still this sort of like bluish tone and then. Once it develops further, it gets into hotter pinks, yellows, reds, and things like that. So um, I like that image too because it's 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 sort of quiet visually. You know, the 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 colors are quiet, but there's a lot of uh, um, uh, stuff going on with his gestures. So. Yeah, I mean, it makes for a very dynamic image, and it 
brings to life the words yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Um, so Jimmy learned all of this from all of these different musicians. And at about this time, he was about 17 years old. Now he bounced around a lot as a kid. Um, and so he really didn't latch on to school the way a typical student would. And he needed some uh, discipline and uh, some structure. And so he decided to drop out of school and join the army following in the footsteps of his father who was a screaming eagle paratrooper who jumped out of planes. So Jimmy followed suit and did the same exact thing, uh, pursuing his goal of uh, basically attaining freedom. So this is verse three, sun sunshine yellow. 18 in the army, miles from home, Jimmy was free and finally on his own. Basic training in California, then off to become a screaming eagle in Kentucky where he would learn to jump from. Planes that pierced clouds in the ocean blue sky, high in the heavens where Jimmy could fly. The roar of the plane and shh of the wind filled Jimmy's eardrums with inspiration. Back on the ground, Jimmy searched for that sound. Jimmy picked at his guitar for that plane rattling sound. Soon, Jimmy became known as the guitar playing freak and his, and his bunk mates began to taunt and tweak and tease and test and steal and hide Jimmy's guitar for some peace and quiet. See, every night Jimmy went to sleep in his bed with this guitar and plucked the sounds in his head. So this is probably of all the spreads, this is probably my most favorite because to me, this really captures him perfectly because we know all of the sounds that he would create. And this is basically the well from which he would begin drawing them from. So how did you uh, tackle this image? Well, I think that the line that got me was the, cause I actually hadn't thought about it before you mentioned it in the book, before you wrote it, that the roar of the engine's plane uh, influenced him. And, and you're right, you know, like the, after you said it, I'm like, Wow, the roar, and that's what his music sounds like. Well, it sounds like the roar of an airplane. So yeah. I made that the focus. If you see the little circles coming out of yeah. the engine. At yeah, the exactly. And expanding and going out, and the circles become the parachutes, and then these little, these little people um, uh, sort of uh, hopping off, and, you know, he's, he's one of them in there. But uh, um, I, I think, you know, when you've got this many pages um, for a book, then you really – can expand on on how to show someone, you know. So, um, you know, in, in the other pages, there's gestures, this, but here I thought, well, why don't I pull out a lot and and get the entire environment of of what, what was going on in the sky? And uh, but it's basically started with the idea of the roar of the engine, and I think I think that's actually a, a great thing that I I hadn't thought of until I read uh, read uh, this passage. Yeah. I mean, but it comes through automatically because once you see that, it's like a, you know, I think of the radar mm -hmm. and we think of uh, the visual of a radar. Right. Uh, the concentric circles getting smaller and smaller and the way they kind of hone in where the home is the uh, engine. Um, you know, and it yeah, wasn't. I mean, even... it's, it's actually, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's sometimes, you know, it's difficult to translate sounds into visuals, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, okay. it, it, once it's done, you're like, oh, it makes perfect sense. But as you're doing it, I'm like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? one? <laughs> and uh, but your what I liked about your text is that the words are very visual. So that actually like made it easier. Like you just pointed the things in the text all the time. And I'm like, OK, I got this one. I, I know what I can do with this. Um, and that's what I like about the, the, the story and then the way it's written is that it really is a visual um, book uh, from from the get go. Yeah, I mean, the, the way that I write in general is uh, I, it almost begs to be illustrated, but I write it that the words serve as the illustration, mm -hmm. but then to have an actual illustration that not only illustrates it, but jumps off and then makes it its own unique thing. I think each panel, you know, throughout the book is, is why it as a whole just stands out because each one really locks in on, you know, what is being covered in that uh, yeah. spread in particular. Thanks. I continue. I'm going to move along <laughs> far towards the end. Verse five, painted black. So at this point, so we go from uh, Jimmy being in the army to um, where he's serving. And uh, basically he decided he was done with the army. <laughs> you know, he was ready to be free. And so 
Uh, he left for Nashville. He and a bandmate left for Nashville. They formed a band. Uh, Jimmy learned that he traveled around honing his craft, honing his skill. And when he got back to Tennessee, he decided he was ready to move to NYC, New York. And when he did, he moved to Harlem, where most Black musicians would live. But his style of music, his style of play didn't lend itself to the people that he was working for, the R&B artists that he was working for. So he went downtown and he worked in more eclectic venues where there was more folk rock, rock and roll, different things going. And Jimmy really took a hold there and a fan um, or he developed his own fans there. And one of the fans um, introduced, was able to introduce him to a producer and that producer had a song, just needed a guitarist and, a, and a, basically needed a musician to perform it. And he wanted to take him to England because that's where he was from. So this is verse five, painted black. On the plane, Jimmy James became Jimmy with an I, a more exotic Jimmy, one M, no Y. From the moment Jimmy landed, he was introduced around as the next big thing the big producer had found. Now this producer knew all the English guitar greats and he couldn't wait to showcase his import from the States. When Jimmy took the stage, wild hair and black skin, Jimmy's guitar spoke of all the places he had been. Childhood sighs beneath gray Seattle skies became silver jet engines piercing blue skies. A slow Southern drawl filled with New York City style echoed into ears as Jimmy played out each mile. And when, it all, and when all those guitar greats heard Jimi Hendrix play, they wanted to quit playing because Jimmy blew them all away. Yeah, those guitar gods all bowed to Jimmy's hand. So now the big producer needed a band for that hand. The first man in Jimmy's band was the bass player, a white cat from England with Afro puffed hair. Last was a drummer making the trio complete, a white jazz cat who banged a driving beat. Now these two English cats knew how to play, but playing behind Jimmy, they kept out of the way. Now, the funny thing about at this point in the story is now Jimmy's front and center. And so in the past, he was the one who, when he would take off, the band leaders would tell him to stop and kick him out. Now he was with his own band and his, and his band mates knew to just lay out and let Jimmy take over. So he finds success in England with the song. The song does become a hit that the producer figured it would. Jimmy begins to write his own songs and begins to develop his own show and begins to develop his own persona. So I'm gonna jump ahead all the way to the end, to the interlude for the big finish, because when I wrote this ending, I was able to actually watch it uh, on uh, a DVD uh, live at Monterey. This, this is when this happened. So I was actually able to watch it. So that made it very easy for me to write about. So here's the interlude. Now, let me break it down. Dig, Jimmy was a wild thing on the guitar strings. And those folks in Monterey never heard such a display when Jimmy fried their ears with his white hot guitar play. But Jimmy wasn't done. Oh no, he wasn't done. The crowd had no idea of what was to come. Yeah, Jimmy pulled out all his show-stopping tricks, you know, behind the back, between the legs, teeth plucking licks. But Jimmy topped himself when he dropped to the ground and knocked notes on his guitar, then held onto the sound. Gave his guitar one last kiss, and with a quick match strike, Jimmy set his guitar on fire with flames flickering bright. Then Jimmy smashed that guitar as tribal drums kept beating, and Jimmy's guitar held that high note, amplified and screeching, like a Cherokee warrior screeching a fierce battle cry as Jimmy showed the world how to kiss the sky. Yeah! Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to throw it to Edel and uh, let him talk to you about all the beautiful artwork behind this book. All right, let me uh, see if I can do this here. All right, so I want to start with me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just so you know how much I, I like rock and roll and like how the, the book connected when I was a little kid. Um, that's what I wanted to be. And we would have these family parties where we would make everything out of cardboard, electric guitars and everything. And we'd um, disrupt the salsa party with a rock and roll party. So these are some pictures of that. Uh, the uh, 
Jimmy's guitar, when I was, uh, I think it was about 10 years ago, I was assigned to do the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame poster uh, for the concert that they were having. And his guitar, not his guitar, because this one's a Gibson, but uh, the idea of a burning guitar uh, was kind of an influence. And I created this poster for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, concert, uh, which I find um, interesting because Charles actually kind of like got the idea for the book at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, while walking around there. So, um, and um uh, then here's some um, some some information you know, or some some background on how I put the book together. Lots of reference, you know, uh, looking at pictures of what Jimmy looked like as a little kid, um, you know, helped me develop the pages of his childhood. Um, the stuff from the army, uh, I, I was able to find a lot of uh, background information about when he, when he was in the military, and then his earliest bands up there in the top right. This is the kind of stuff that I need to create images. You know, I need to research a lot. So I spent a lot of time looking at um, images that, that I would kind of use as, um, um, you know, background and, and uh, information for these images. Now, these were the first sketches that I created, uh, trying to figure out how, what this book was going to look like. In the end, it doesn't look at all like these sketches, <laughs> but this idea of sort of a 60s, 70s acid rock kind of thing like swirls and circles and things like that that's what i had in my initial <clears throat> sketches uh, here then these are uh the first sketches when i sit down with just pen and paper to try to figure out how to draw him so here are some sketches uh, as i'm developing the pages um this went on for quite a while trying to figure out um all the little there's the parachute page um so this is the first step for every illustrator the next step is to create uh, my black line drawings. These are all uh, printed with oil-based ink on paper and then um, colored uh, digitally, but they're, they're colored digitally from many different things that I have in my studio. So I have drips, paint, things like that. I scan all of that into my computer and I combine it with the black and white uh, line work. This is the black and white uh, line work that I inked for this page. And here's the, the final. This one uh, is the black one and white line. And then the background is actually just a big old messy slop that I put together <laughs> on, a, on a piece of board. And I scanned that and I threw it into the background. So I, I, I do try to um, combine the, the physical and the digital as much as possible. In the end, my work ends up looking like silk screens or, or something like that. And that's what I'm going for. And here are some of uh, images in, in full resolution. Uh, this drip thing is actually a mistake that happened in my photocopier <laughs> where it just bled, <laughs> bled out. And I just looked at it and go, I could use this someday. And I saved it, scanned it, and then uh, used it in, as part of this image. So, uh, you know, the same way musicians work with uh, mistakes, I, as an artist, also work with mistakes. And I always tell my students to, to never think of a mistake as something bad. Think of it as an opportunity. Um, and I, I do think that musicians and artists have something in common uh, when it comes to that. And for the cover, I had done these, these paintings a few years ago. Um, they're, they're like memorials to, to family members that have passed away and things like that. And I was like, well, I, I really like those, those um, still lives. How can I include them in here somehow? And I, um, I had drawn Jimmy's, um, in the, you know, the front cover and just Jimmy with an afro. And I'm like, Maybe I can, I can combine these flowers that I have from these paintings into his afro. And that's what I ended up doing here. So you can see here where that came from. Bits and pieces of these paintings ended up on, in his hair. And it really gave that whole flower power, 1960s, and, and also a memorial um, to, uh, to Jimi Hendrix. Uh, and, it, you know, I really, it's one of my favorite images is the cover, actually. Um, yeah, mine too. And here is a, a close-up of the whole thing. I, I really... I, I never got like overly proud of anything, but I'm like, this is one image that I'm very proud of that I, it just, it really came together and visually. It's like a new direction for some of my work, including some, some of my personal paintings into my illustration work. And here's the, the final book here. So that's it. All right. Questions. Thank you guys so much. That was all really cool. It was like a really awesome book. Um, to the audience, we're open for questions. So just type any questions you have in the chat and we can get to them. 
But for me personally, my first question to you guys is how did this all happen? How did you get into the children's book industry? How did you meet each other? How did this idea come about for this book? Um, I'll start with that. Um, I've been doing books since 1999. And one of the, the first things that you learn that you're about to learn <laughs> and your readers and the, everybody listening is about to learn is that when an author and an illustrator do the book, they often don't meet each other um, because doing a book and Edel kind of uh, alluded to it earlier is, is, is like doing a movie. You know, you have your director, you have a producer, you have an actor, you have all of these different, you have a screenwriter, you have all of these different people doing different parts. And so uh, I wrote the best um, book that I could for Jimmy in that regard, uh, turn it into my editor and it's the editor's job. The editor would be like the director. The editor is the one that says, okay, what illustrations can we, what illustrator can we pair this up with to make it the best that we can possibly be? So I did have the idea of making it, you know, we really wanted it to have that kind of Peter Max 60s, you know, psychedelic style to it. And then uh, Neil mentioned Edel and I, I wasn't familiar with his work. And then, um, you know, he showed it to me and I was very excited. Um, yeah, I, I, um, I also started doing children's books back in 1999, <laughs> um, uh, in a strange way. Uh, it was, um, I actually, I didn't grow up with children's books at all. You know, it, it just wasn't part of my life uh, as a kid. My parents didn't have books. I, you know, grew up in a very uh, poor household where the books were at school, you know? <laughs> and uh, then um, when, I, uh, when I, I went to art school, I graduated and all that. And my work uh, started getting published in the New Yorker magazine and other places. And that's how uh, my, um, my agent found me through the New Yorker by seeing my work uh, in print. And I started working with her to, um, I, I, you know, illustrate um, children's books and I illustrate many other things, but she's the one that handles a lot of my children's books. And I've done about 12 of them so far. Um, and, uh, uh, it just happened. Uh, I got into the business by my own, doing my own work for various publications. So. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, Sam O asked, um, how much Charles, how much research did you do for this book? Was there anything that surprised you? Was there anything that you weren't able to include? Um, there was, there was a lot that surprised me mostly because when we hear of Jimmy, we don't hear of the things that surprised me, that he was in the army, that he earned the Screaming Eagle patch. He's a paratrooper, he was a paratrooper, uh, that he actually played football. He was good at football. <laughs> he had long arms and long fingers, which he would eventually use for the guitar, uh, but he used that for, um, you know, uh, but earlier than that, you know, he used it for football. Um, it took a lot of research, but, and, you know, and I wrote this book a while ago. And so a lot of stuff wasn't available and really what you're looking for when you're a children's book author doing a biography is you're, you're looking to basically connect the dots of their story and then fill in the details to help inspire kids. And so it was real important for me to show the process that he went to through of uh, practicing every single day, uh, teaching himself a song every day. And, though he, and then even though he did drop out of high school, the fact that he knew he needed structure and then got that in the military. So um, the military angle was probably the biggest thing that surprised me. But then, you know, as Adela mentioned, when you think of him getting these sounds from the plane, then it all started to really tie into his overall story. I think what, what's interesting about him being in the military is that you just, you know, you don't, you think of Jimi Hendrix as this love guy, like it's just chill, man. Exactly. You got to be pretty tough to be in the military and jump out of an airplane. You know, it's, it's exactly. like this whole other side uh, and all the training that you have to go through. It's, you know, it's not, not easy. And, and it's just, it's so surprising. It's such a contrast to uh, who, who he became eventually. Exactly. And for our audience, just to clarify, there isn't a chat that you press the Q&A button in the bottom, and then that's how you submit your question. And John Young's asks the both of you, what is the most inspiring thing about Jimi Hendrix for you guys? I'll let Fidel talk first on this one. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, I, I think for me, uh, you know, as an artist, is the it's the inventiveness. It's the the because um, it's it's what I try to do with my own things all the time. Is it, this idea that something has existed a certain way for you know hundreds of years? <laughs> Uh, the guitar has been played a certain, and, and then taking it and and just um, when you know when it's Jimi Hendrix playing it and you know what he did and how sort of it, it changed rock and roll. It was like before Hendrix, after Hendrix. And now you hear a lot of bands, you know, like the White Stripes or, uh, you know, um, a lot of other bands that are uh, played in the 90s and things like that. And they're just kind of like doing something that Jimi Hendrix already did in a new way. But it's it's sort of like uh, um, he started this whole other way of thinking about what a rock musician could be, um, and and also that the, that he was uh, African American. It just it just changed the whole dynamic of it. Um, he's he's much uh, more legitimately linked to the history of rock and roll than a lot of other rock and roll musicians. Yeah, I mean. Um... Just like Adele said, the big thing that I got was his innovation as an artist. But then also, you know, as I learned of his story and the, you know, the, the, the blues and the trials and the tribulation, the abuse and stuff that he went through as a kid, was learning, you know, as an artist, how to mine something that's difficult like that. He took the pain of losing his mom and he really, you know, it, he internalized it. It was a pressure. It was a balloon waiting to pop. And music became that release valve that allowed him to express himself. And once he was able to do that, he went all in on it, you know, practicing, like I said, all the time. And that inspired me as I was doing it because I looked at it more from the innovation, you know, perspective to start with. But then as I started learning his story, I grew a new appreciation for how he mined the, um, you know, the, the depths of his life, the, the bad parts, if you will, how he really used that as a passion to really, you know, just really express himself. And that's ultimately what he was trying to do his whole life was just truly express himself. And, you know, the fact that he was able to take sound and think of it three dimensionally, you know, it was pretty remarkable. And so for me as an artist, it makes you look at a problem. You know, he basically had something is like, oh, well, what if we did this? What if we did that? And so me as an artist, I'm able to say the same thing. What if I did this? Like they said, you can never do that. But what if we did that like to the extreme, you know, it, and it, you know, he inspires that playfulness and invention. And Vasna N asks, do you think his time and experiences in Europe where there was less discrimination helped him become more famous worldwide? Um, yes and no, because the thing was like, even though he experienced success in Europe, he still experienced racism. <laughs> Let's get that straight. Uh, that was one thing that I did learn about too. It wasn't just, oh, you're here. So we love you. Like, yes, they did, but he still had some hurdles to overcome there. The fact, what, what made it difficult, more difficult for him in America is that he was a black musician playing the music that he was. If he was white, no issues, people would be listening to him and stuff, but he wasn't expected to play that. So the, the, the gigs that he was hired for, they were kind of surprised when he would go off on his own little tangents. And so his style of music was more accepted in England. So that did make it easier for him. And once he, he was able to basically develop his chops, develop that experience so that when he does get to Monterey Pop Festival, the first time he plays in, Cal in the United States, he's 100% ready to uh, take the country by storm. Yeah, I definitely think black artists breaking into genres that aren't the traditional things people think of as like black, they don't have a hard time breaking into those industries. Um, Eileen Kroll asks, how does your book address his drug use? Um, point blank, it doesn't. Um, and mostly because pick a book. They all talk about it. <laughs> and, and that is one thing that me as a black artist, I really wanted to focus on the triumph over the tragedy because too often our black musicians, our black artists, our black entertainers were reduced to that statement that, 
he had all his drug use. You know, there was plenty of rock and rollers around at that time. And I'm not going to say he's fine, whatever, whatever. But the fact is that, um, that was what was happening. And so I'm not going to address that, not because I'm ignoring it, but because I'm putting the focus on how he became the icon that we know. And so to that end, anytime I start talking about that, it means I'm not talking about his life story, his, uh, the triumphs of his life, which led him to that point. And for both of you, I wanted to ask, like, I know I like to listen to music when I'm doing artistic things or writing. So did you guys have a favorite Jimi Hendrix song or album that really got you going where you were kind of like, I don't want to work on this book right now, but you listened to that and you were like, yeah, let me get to it. Um, I'll let Adele answer that one first. Um, I don't know, she's got so many. I mean, I, I was listening to it the whole time, but um, you know, Cross Town Traffic is a great song. The one that I was looking, I was looking at performances of him. Uh, I don't, I mean, I'm, don't recall the song right now, but it was where he burns the guitar and that whole bit. I mean, that that that's a really long video, yes. and how it just expands and it, it it almost gets, you know, very like abstract, almost like John Cagey kind of <laughs> stuff, yeah. where where the guitar is just doing its thing. And uh, so I watched that video for a really long time, and 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 also like there's a lot of like sexuality in the way he deals with the guitar and he the way he moves. Um, which is great for an artist, you know, but um, yeah, when I was working on sketches and that's all I was listening to all, you know, I mean, I, it's sort of like, I, I listened to him a lot when I was in college, in college is when I first heard about him and I was like, Oh my God, Jimi Hendrix. And, uh, and I've listened to more of the year, but now when the, when the project came along and that's all I was listening to for a long time. Um, but uh, um, yeah, I, I, it's really hard to pick a, like a favorite song. I think they're all great. Yeah. I mean, I think the first one, that really stood out to me was all along the watchtower yeah just as a writer uh the, the i mean the, the sound is ridiculous but just as a writer listening to that first line there must be some kind of way out of here said the joker to the thief i mean that's and he did not write that dylan did but coming out of his mouth and with that sound behind it you're just kind of now you're listening like what is going on here <laughs> you know and I, I, I experienced that with that. Uh, Voodoo Child is one of my favorites. Uh, Are You Experienced, one of my favorite albums. Um, uh, Manish Boy is another one. Hear My Train of Coming. Uh, I gravitate more toward his rock stuff than his blue stuff, but some of the blue stuff um, gets a little funkier. And I got really into that, like in Manish Boy and in Hear My Train of Coming, he really, his guitar goes between rock guitar and more of that waka waka, you know, funk guitar that you would hear a little bit later on in the 70s. And so uh, it was a little bit of everything, but you know, those ones and, and the songs that I mentioned in the playlist, uh, including Crosstown Traffic, uh, you know, like I said, th those are all in regular rotation. Great. I think this is a great final question. Katie G asks, what do you hope the reader will take away from the book with both the words and the art? Um, for me, what I hope they take away from Jimmy's story in general is seeing, you know, how a child who lived, you know, when he was born and raised, went through such heartache and hardship, how he developed a determination uh, how he taught himself a lot of things. He taught himself to draw. He taught himself to play the guitar with both hands. You know, his father, I mentioned that his father thinks the, he's naturally left-handed. He actually drew right-handed and do some other things right-handed, but he was naturally left-handed. And so he learned to play the guitar with his left hand, but when his dad would see it, his, his dad believed the left hand was of the devil. So he would trick him and play with the right hand. So he ended up learning how to play with both hands and he played learned a song every single day. He got himself into the military, like Adele said, making it through paratrooper school, you know. Um, just seeing all of these things that he did from sheer will and determination. And that literally is a path, you know, when you say to kids, you know, work hard. Well, what does that mean? Well, yeah. that's what it means. <laughs> this, is, this is what it means.
Yeah, I, I think I, I, I would uh, think that people, uh, our kids especially, would, would get the same thing is, is that uh, we do tell the kids, well, you got to work hard. You got to work hard. <laughs> I don't know exactly what that is. You know, like, uh, how do you get from here to there? How do you get from a childhood to to a superstar rock and roll or an artist or a writer? And I think the, the book does a great job of explaining that it's, a, it's sort of a step by step process and that there you have. Uh, you diverge, you go in different directions, but eventually if you stick with something, you, you, you succeed at it. I mean, I, I never imagined I'd be an artist. I'm sure Charles didn't imagine he would be a writer. You, you, you have sort of, you can, you visualize these things, what you think can happen. Um, but yeah, you don't know exactly how you're going to get there, but it is the sticking through with something and, and, and continuing and failing and coming back and eventually things start clicking. So, and I think it shows in, in, in his story. Great. Well, that is all the time that we have for our questions. Thank you all so much for your great contributions. Many thanks to Charles and Adele for joining us. Um, the link to purchase Song for Jimmy is in the chat. Uh, thank you to DC Public Library and DC Public Library Foundation. And especially thank you to Tony for moderating today. Um, of course, thank you to our viewers for joining us and thanks again everyone. Keep 